The local government news roundup is proudly supported by Davidson. For 30 years, Davidson has been strengthening the local government sector by identifying and providing the people, expertise and experience that local government needs to enhance its capability, productivity and performance. Davidson is nationally recognised for its executive recruitment services and over the past four years has built a business advisory practice rapidly evolving into one of the nation's foremost and trusted local government business consultancy firms. The Davidson methodology and approach is simple. Thinking beyond now and aiming to be a valued partner with your local government, not just for the immediate project, but for the next 30 years. Speak to Justin Hanney or Seamus Scanlon to find out more or head to davidsonwp.com.au. Davidson, your future, your partner. Today on the Local Government News Roundup, claims that fringe party groups are taking over the city of Greater Geelong. A $36 million price tag for technology upgrades at Darabin. Brimbank to be the home for Australia's first Vietnamese museum. The New South Wales Government ordered to pay $200 million to a local council. A remote council calls for government help to manage its water responsibilities. A former UK council leader found to have bullied staff, creating a toxic environment. And how local governments in Japan are using AI to play matchmaker to combat declining birth rates. Just some of the many local government stories getting our attention today. It's time to round them up. Morning, I'm Chris Eddy. It's Monday the 25th of March 2024 and time for another local government news roundup. A curated selection of news from and about councils across Australia and beyond. Brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government, and with support from Davidson, the nationally recognised local government recruitment and business advisory service. First up, some of the stories making local government news around Victoria and claims that fringe party groups have tipped the balance of power at the city of Greater Geelong have been reported by the Geelong Advertiser. It describes a clear power shift defined broadly as a move to the left as a result of the three newest members of the council since the last elections in 2020 and subsequent countback processes. The report comes as the state government is yet to publicly release a municipal monitor's report which was given to the local government minister two months ago. Melissa Horne's office said the minister is considering the report and that it will be made public in due course. A master plan for the redevelopment of the Frankston City Centre has been referred by the council to an independent planning panel after receiving more than 400 submissions from the community. The Age has reported that the plan, which includes potential high-rise buildings near the beach, has been a lightning rod of debate, with Melbourne Water among those opposing it. The Water Authority says the plan ignores the risks of flooding in areas where new development would occur. Darabin City Council will tonight consider a recommendation for a $36.5 million investment in IT systems. A report to the council meeting estimates an investment of $31 million would be required over four years to maintain current legacy systems, with many of those likely to become obsolete. Last year's Municipal Monitor report recommended the council invest in replacing its ageing IT systems and Local Government Minister Melissa Horn has asked it to report back to her on its technology plans. The estimated $36.5 million needed for a new enterprise resource planning system would require budget commitments over the next four financial years. Brimbank City Council has confirmed the sale of land to Vietnamese Museum Australia Limited for a new cultural museum to be located next to Sunshine Station. The museum will serve the city's large Vietnamese community, which makes up 17% of the population. The council is planning a welcome plaza to celebrate all multicultural communities. The museum's location will support the visitor economy for the Sunshine CBD, aided by the planned Melbourne Airport Rail and nearby hotels. Four hotels have received planning approval, with one already under construction. 
The state government has committed $143 million for Stage 1 of the station master plan, which will connect to Melbourne Airport Rail. The decision to build the museum in Brimbank follows an unsuccessful attempt in Footscray last year, which fell through due to a dispute over the location and use of a roller door for loading purposes. Still in Brimbank, and the Council's efforts to add the former Sunshine Technical School to the Victorian Heritage Register continue despite a recent setback. The Council lodged an application in September 2021 to protect the architecturally and historically significant building after learning of plans to demolish vacant buildings on the site. Despite a recommendation against inclusion on the register, the Council has requested a hearing. It has also sought confirmation from the State Government that measures are in place to protect the heritage buildings from vandalism and damage and has proposed turning the unused site into a co-working arts hub. VCAT has approved a 105-lot residential subdivision in Knoxfield despite over 1,170 objections and potential environmental impacts, including the removal of a water body home to several species, such as the threatened blue-billed duck. Knox City Council has expressed disappointment with the outcome, but noted that they had negotiated extensive permit conditions during the appeal process. Those conditions include the creation of new wetlands before de commissioning the existing water body to give existing species the best chance of relocation. The new Monash Tennis Centre and Multisport Pavilion in Glen Waverley Sports Hub is now open, funded by $21 million from the State Government's North East Link project and $5.77 million from the City of Monash. The facility includes 18 tennis courts, a pavilion, a golf driving range and a cafe. It will serve as the new home for major tournaments and the Glenvale Tennis Club and will be available for community use and local and regional tournaments. Monash Mayor Nicky Luo said the project will be a game changer for tennis in Monash. In a joint operation between the City of Whittlesea and the EPA, numerous builders have been found violating environmental regulations across over 40 building sites. Only one site was fully compliant, with the rest facing notices to comply and infringements for violation of the Environmental Protection Act and the City of Whittlesea's building site code of practice. The council says the operation has highlighted the need for ongoing oversight to ensure environmental standards are upheld. Looking at some Victorian council briefs now and Benalla Rural City Council has joined the Victorian Energy Collaboration, the largest emissions reduction project by local government in the country. The move aligns with the council's commitment to sustainability and is expected to result in significant cost savings. The contract with VCO will commence on the 1st of July and run until the 31st of December 2030. Tawong Shire Council has applied for $25 million in federal funding to support the High Country Rail Trail project. The project, which is expected to cost over $22 million, could generate over $11 million annually for the local economy and create 73 new jobs. And Hepburn Shire Council has launched the Circular Hepburn Toolkit for Business and Beyond to assist local businesses in reducing costs and environmental impact and to promote the circular economy. The toolkit includes a booklet, a card deck of circular economy strategies and a web page and provides information on the concept of circular economy, local case studies, strategies for implementing circularity in businesses and links to global resources. Listening to the Local Government News Roundup, it's Monday the 25th of March 2024 and this is episode number 316. The podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, your councillor support network and by Davidson, nationally recognised for their recruitment services and for their business advisory services. The National Roundup now. The New South Wales government has been ordered to pay over $200 million to Parramatta Council for land acquired to build a new metro station, according to a report from the Daily Telegraph. The Land and Environment Court ruled last week that Sydney Metro would have to pay about $85 million more than it had initially offered. Despite this, Premier Chris Minns has confirmed that the cost would not impact the overall budget of Metro West as it was within existing contingencies. The Metro West project linking Parramatta to the CBD is expected to be completed by 2032. 
New legislation passed by the New South Wales Parliament grants councils greater authority to fine those who breach environmental protection regulations. The Environment Protection Legislation Amendment allows councils to issue fines for illegal dumping, with penalties more than doubling for common environmental offences. It's been described as the most significant amendment to environment protection rules since 1991, and it also introduces recall powers, public transparency measures, strengthened investigations and licence bans. Sydney's Bayside Council is investigating several cases of tree vandalism along the Grand Parade and nearby parkland where Norfolk pines and banksia trees are showing signs of decline and poisoning. The council is examining CCTV footage and has contacted nearby residents. The trees are being monitored and tests are being conducted to determine the best course of action. The council has a policy of replacing any destroyed tree with two more. Central Darlingshire Council says it is struggling financially to operate and maintain local water utilities without government assistance. The council, which serves towns with a low population and socio-economic issues, has some of the highest water charges in New South Wales, making water unaffordable for many residents. The council, which has been under administration since 2014, has put a proposal to transfer all council-owned water assets to the state government to alleviate the financial burden. Under the proposal, the council would continue to operate and maintain the assets on a contractual basis. And the City of Canada Bay Council has expressed concerns over new planning reforms proposed by the state government which could significantly alter building heights and densities and strain local infrastructure. While the council supports new housing, it emphasises the need for careful planning and infrastructure investment. The council also insists on the importance of community engagement in planning reforms and it has detailed its concerns in formal submissions to the New South Wales government. The Queensland Government has committed $15 million towards the construction of a multi-level car park in the Weenham Creek Priority Development Area. The project has been advocated for by Redland City Council for the past decade and it's part of the Government's TransLink services. The Redland Investment Corporation recently signed an MOU with Consolidated Properties Group to deliver the car park and a retail precinct. The City of Wyala Council in South Australia is testing sand drift fencing technology to collect and prevent sand from leaving Wyala Beach. The trial, part of the sand replenishment project, uses sand breaks to aid in sand collection and prevent beach erosion. The fences are cost-effective, non-invasive and blend into the environment, providing protection for vegetation and fostering new plant growth. The trial will last approximately two years to assess effectiveness and durability. And in Western Australia, the city of Subiaco is considering becoming the first local council in the state to offer exclusive parking for e-bikes, according to a report from Perth Now. The plan includes minimum requirements for e-bike charging facilities at bike parking facilities, with users providing their own charging cables. The proposal aims to promote sustainability and responds to a rise in e-bike sales, which accounted for 12% of bicycle sales in Australia, up from 3% in 2020. However, concerns have been raised about the risk of lithium battery fires linked to e-bike charges, with more than 170 fires reported in the past two years by the state's Department of Fire and Emergency Services. Now some more council briefs from around the country. The city of Moreton Bay in Queensland has joined the Welcoming Cities Network, an initiative dedicated to nurturing exclusive communities. The announcement aligns with Harmony Week, during which the council will host various events. Moreton Bay is the 84th member of Welcoming Cities, representing over 50% of the Australian population. Aubrey City Council has launched the Celebrating Difference campaign, a result of its first multicultural plan. The campaign aims to create opportunities to discuss racism in a safe community environment and celebrate the diverse multicultural community. The campaign includes television commercials, city banners, flags and diversity messaging on bus shelters. The Grand Clifftop Walk, a new 19-kilometre track in the Blue Mountains, has officially opened. The walkway, which took four years and $10 million to complete, provides a continuous route from Wentworth Falls to Katoomba. The walk is expected to increase visitation by 50,000 per year and boost the region's economy.
And Ballina Shire Council has launched a new beach safety program which includes critical response kits and rescue tubes at various locations along the Shire's beaches. The equipment is intended for community use in emergencies and aims to improve patient outcomes. It's a joint effort with defibrillators donated by the Matthew Hardy Memorial Project and assistance from the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and Surf Lifesaving New South Wales. Thanks for joining me for the Local Government News Roundup today. Don't forget to head to lgnewsroundup.com for more information about each episode, including the transcript and the links to the stories we reference. And a quick note, with Easter almost upon us, there'll be just the two episodes this week, the next one coming your way on Thursday before the Easter break. Time for the International Spotlight, where we look at some council stories of interest from across the globe, starting, as we usually do, in the UK, where the former leader of South Tyneside Council, Ian Malcolm, has been found to have bullied officers, contributing to a toxic work environment. An independent inquiry upheld allegations of unreasonable behaviour towards two officers. Malcolm, who resigned in 2020, has denied all allegations. His resignation coincided with a police investigation into his use of corporate credit cards, which found he'd inappropriately incurred about £19,000 of personal costs. But, as BBC News reported, despite the findings, no sanctions can be imposed, as Malcolm is no longer a councillor. An arrest has been made in an investigation into alleged fraud at Guildford Borough Council's housing maintenance service. The police investigation began in November and the council also launched an internal investigation in February. BBC News reported that the arrested individual, a man in his 50s, is currently in police custody. Council tenants have expressed stress over unfinished repairs since the investigation started. The Local Government Information Unit, LGIU, and the Northern Ireland Local Government Association has launched a new partnership service to support councils across Northern Ireland. The new collaboration will see the two organisations supporting councils across Northern Ireland with the shared aim of empowering local democracy across the 11 councils. Jonathan Carwest, the Chief Executive of LGIU, said LGIU is proud to have been supporting the vital work of local government across the UK for more than 40 years, that we now also provide services to councils in the Republic of Ireland and Australia is a testament to the value LGIU delivers to the sector. From Canada, the mayor of the City of Medicine Hat in Alberta has been stripped of her powers and pay by the City Council for breaching the City's code of conduct in her treatment of the City Manager. According to CBC News, the Council approved a list of sanctions, including suspension of Mayor Lindsay Clark's presiding duties and a prohibition from entering the administration area of City Hall. Her salary has also been cut in half. Mayor Clark, who was not present at the meeting, expressed her disagreement with the decision on Facebook and said she's considering legal options. Toronto's City Council has approved a review into the feasibility of converting city-owned properties, including parking lots, into housing or community infrastructure projects. CBC reported that the city owns 300 parking lots and an initial examination suggests 130 of those could potentially support housing. The council has directed that any parking lots considered for development must include affordable housing. A full report on suitable sites for conversion is expected by the end of the year. To the US and Los Angeles City Council has halted approvals for a proposed gondola project to Dodger Stadium, pending further studies on its potential impacts. The council has approved $500,000 for the Los Angeles Department of Transportation to conduct assessments. NBC News Los Angeles reported that concerns have been raised about the project's impact on local communities and the lack of a comprehensive study on Dodger Stadium traffic since 1990. The project, originally proposed by former Dodgers owner Frank McCourt, has faced opposition over gentrification, privacy and environmental concerns, but it also has support from many Dodgers fans and businesses. And finally to Japan, where local governments are getting involved in matchmaking using artificial intelligence as part of efforts to combat declining birth rates. Japan's central government is supporting the initiative, providing expanded subsidies to prefectures to hold AI matchmaking events. 
The technology is used to analyse compatibility between potential partners, leading to unexpected successful matches. The AI systems recommend partners based on personal information and internet browsing history, broadening the range of potential partners. The website Kyoto News reported that as of March last year, 31 of Japan's 47 prefectures offered AI matchmaking services, with Tokyo joining in December. I'm willing to bet you hadn't considered that as a use of AI for local governments. But you learn about all sorts of curious things here on the Local Government Roundup, and that brings us up to date for the 25th of March, 2024. The podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Davidson. All the links to the stories referenced in today's episode and a full transcript can be found at lgnewsroundup.com. There's much more at the website. Check it out to learn also how you can support the Roundup by becoming a subscriber through a small monthly contribution, which you can cancel at any time. The Local Government News Roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Our next episode comes your way on Thursday. Until then, thanks for listening and bye for now. Thank you.